at the Chesapeake? Okay, good, good. So you agree they do exist, they're not just a myth. Excellent. Um, because that's initially what I began, I began to wonder. So my PhD uh, was on bottlenose dolphins in the Murray Firth in Scotland. And um, I was studying dolphins there uh, during a time that actually an offshore wind farm uh, was proposed to be built. So we were looking at what the dolphins were doing, their distribution, habitat use, and then we looked to see if that changed at all after the construction of the wind farm. So having obviously had an interest in dolphins, uh, when I moved over here, I asked the question at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, oh, do you get dolphins in the bay here? And they said, oh, occasionally, yes. Um, and it is important to remember that these are, these are a natural part of the ecosystem. I mean, there are records uh, going back to the 1800s talking about dolphins that come in the bay. And we know from the um, stranding reports that also occasionally get live sightings that, yes, they, they're regularly seen every year. There were a small number, maybe 15 to 20 uh, per year. So they are a natural part of the ecosystem, and they were regular visitors. Visitors, but perhaps not terribly frequent. So um, I was actually at the Chesapeake Biological Lab. Um, I started in 2010. So what took me so long? <laughs> Why wasn't I studying, studying dolphins from the start? And my concern was that dolphins just weren't frequent enough visitors that we could really uh, do a research project on them. But uh, I took uh, three approaches, we've taken three approaches to try and learn about dolphins in the bay and what we lear are learning is that they are much more frequent visitors than we thought. So first of all, let's, let's just back up a little bit and talk a little bit about bottlenose dolphins um, and make sure we all know a little bit about them. Uh, so first of all, what type of fish is a bottlenose dolphin? And this is a reading test. Yes, right. It's a marine mammal. Um, and apparently we need to tell my colleagues that because they put me in the fisheries department. Um, but they are marine mammals. They do breathe air. They do give birth to live young. And they do nurse their young. Um, they can weigh, it says, 300 to 1,400 pounds. Um, so they get bigger a lot quickly, very quickly after they're born, very fat, rich milk. Um, and these animals can get on the order of about six feet. Uh, the ones that I was studying in Scotland are the same species, but because the water is colder, they're actually a little bit bigger. Um, they tend to be the chunky dolphins. They have very uh, big bodies and they have short fins. Why would they have big round? bodies and short fins in colder water. Right. Um, yes, just you probably learn a sea survival as well. You don't want to be losing heat through your extremities, so you want to have a nice big round body that's generating heat and a small surface area over which you're losing it. So the ones in Scotland will not win the beauty prize, um, but here we um, have dolphins that tend to be a, a little bit smaller, but still uh, wonderful to watch and say the length can vary from six right up to 12 feet long. Now, um, it's difficult to measure what age they can live to because currently we don't have a research project that has spanned the entire length of a bottlenose dolphin. Um, but we think they can live up to 50 years old. Uh, they eat a variety of fish and squid. And again, it can be difficult to de determine exactly what they are eating because most of what we learn are from the dead stranded animals. And of course, those might not have been eating recently or they might strand somewhere different than where they they'd actually been feeding. So though, even those that strand in the bay, we don't know if that's where they were feeding. But most likely, they're going to eat a variety of things, including menhaden, striped bass, variety of fish. And they're usually found in groups. Now, interestingly, um, in um, estuaries and bays, generally those group sizes tend to be a little smaller, on the order of a few dolphins up to maybe about 12. Um, and so that was what I was expecting here in the bay. Generally, we don't see the really big group sizes of you know, 20, 50, 100 dolphins, except out in the ocean. But we found that actually we were getting reports of very large group sizes of dolphins in the bay. Um, so that's really interesting. And they are highly social animals. They live in what we call fission fusion societies. So they don't live quite like we do where you have so that family structure. You live with your mom, dad, you have your kids. Um, they will mix with different dolphins. So a mother will, will stay with her calf. Usually that calf will stay with her for four to five years before it separates. But otherwise, that, those individuals may freely mix. It may be males, it may be females. 
and so they do a lot of communicating. Um, any so the animal tends to do a lot of talking, and as we'll see, the dolphins are really chatty. Uh, they can be seen leaping and bow riding. Um, these are the dolphins that you've probably seen at the Baltimore Aquarium. You may, if you have seen them out in the ocean or in the bay, they are really fun to watch. And I've studied many species of marine mammals now, including the largest. What's the largest species? What's the largest species on the planet? Blue whales. So I have studied uh, blue whales off California. I say these are still my favorites. They are so fun to watch. Um, so I do think it's absolutely wonderful if you can go out and see these animals in the wild. But I do just want to remind everyone, these animals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So that means please do not feed or harass the dolphins. If you do encounter dolphins, the, the responsible wildlife viewing guidelines recommend you stay 50 yards away. If the dolphins approach you, then maintain a steady course. Um, if you are stationary, they may be putting your engine into neutral. And if you have fishing gear out, then you might want to bring that in. Make sure no one's getting entangled in gear. So just a reminder, these are a protected species, and please just be careful around them. So as I said, they do a lot of talking. Now, Unlike us, instead of using sight as their primary sense, they use sound. Why do they do that? Why don't they just look at each other and see things? Sound travels better in water than sight. Yeah, so how much faster does sound travel in water than air? Does anyone know? I remember that. Ooh. Okay, so it's about five times faster. So it travels about 300 meters per second in air and 1,500 meters per second in water. So tra sound travels really well underwater. But what else? Has anyone snorkeled or been diving in the water or even just looked in the Chesapeake Bay? If you drop something and you're like, oops, that's gone. It's really murky. <laughs> I mean, so maybe in the winter we get some nice uh, clear spells, but a lot of time it's very murky. So um, it's just much more effective for many marine mammals. They're using sound rather than vision as their primary sense. So um, we're going to uh, turn the volume up. I'm going to give that a 12. Um, so we might, I might go uh, back actually so we make sure that it plays. So if we're going to go up even more. So we're hearing several things here. Um, I'm showing you here a spectrogram. Uh, so here's a little bit of science. X-axis here on the bottom, we've got time. So as you hear the sound, it's playing along. Uh, this is the frequency of the sound. Now we can mainly hear between about 20 hertz, which is right near the bottom, up to about 20 kilohertz. So some of the stuff at the top you may not be able to hear very well. But dolphins can. And in fact, dolphins will produce echolocation clicks, which is what these vertical lines are, uh, right up to 130 kilohertz, which is well beyond our hearing. Now these echolocation clicks are acting like a sonar system. So they're producing a click, and then they're listening for that echo as it bounces off an object and comes back. They can then determine the distance, the size, and the shape of that object. So that helps them to navigate. It's also how they're finding their food. So when they are um, hunting for food, they'll do click, 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 click. And then as they encounter something of interest, as they hone in on that, they can click faster and faster because the distance is getting shorter and the echo is coming back more quickly. So as we get these what we call feeding buzzes, as these clicks become more frequent, we can tell when they're honing in on prey. So that gives us some information about what the animals are doing and when we think they're feeding. We also have uh, these what look like squiggles here. So the colors here are showing you the blue um, is the quieter sound. So the color is showing you how loud it is, with blue being quieter and the green is louder. And um, these whistle sounds, this is the social communication, we think. And in fact, dolphins are also thought to have names. We call them signature whistles, where when they meet other dolphins, they'll call out their name. So it's just like we might say, hi, it's me, it's Helen. Um, and so they're communicating with each other and they are very vocal. So this is a very useful tool for us because it means we can detect the animals. We don't have to tag them. We're not emitting any sound or doing anything. All we do 
is put underwater microphones in the water and we can just listen to the sounds of the ocean and hear these dolphin sounds. Now there's a green area at the bottom here and maybe if we can play this, can we play the sound maybe one more time? Um, so, so maybe you can tell me what you think the other sound is that you're hearing that's not the dolphins. Chugga, chugga, chugga. So what do you think that lower frequency noise is that you're hearing the chugga, chugga, chugga in the background? It's boat noise. <laughs> so, um, so yes, we frequently are hearing boat engines. Um, I mean, the, the place is busy out there, and I think people are expecting this pristine ocean environment. It's so quiet. But, of course, there's lots of activity out there, and because sound travels so far, we can th hear things over quite long distances. So it doesn't mean that the boat was right by the dolphins, necessarily, but we, just, we can hear all this other uh, noise in the ocean. Um, so, as I mentioned, we can use these underwater microphones called hydrophones to listen to the sounds. And one we put at the end of our pier in Solomons, Maryland. So this is in the Patuxent River. Um, and these are showing you detection. So initially, uh, we were doing this just as a side project. To say, I, in 2015, I was still skeptical about how often dolphins were coming into the bay. And so we had hydrophones out there when, when they were available. We were also using them offshore, um, off Ocean City. Um, so we didn't have equal effort across years. But this is showing you for 2015, 2017, um, for this period, say sometimes we had a hydrophone out in one of the years, sometimes in three of the years. But what we can see generally, just for this period I've got here of July to October, is that generally we had much higher detections in July and into early August. Um, so that seemed to be a time when the dolphins were more frequent. And what I've got on the y-axis here, the average weekly DPM, this is detection positive minutes. So this means that within a minute we had at least one dolphin detection. And here we're detecting those echolocation clicks. So it just gives us a measure of their, their presence in the area. Now having detected them in the Patuxent River, we were then also talking to collaborators, uh, Janet Mann's team at Georgetown University, and she was doing photo identification um, of the dorsal fin of the dolphins in the Potomac River. And she, over the last two years, has managed to ID over 500 individual dolphins. And that is over the span of just a few days. So most likely we have thousands of dolphins coming into the bay. And we had no idea it would be that many. And interestingly, they also seem to be coming from different populations. So this seems to be a bit of a mixing pot in the Chesapeake Bay. So we, in collaboration with a fisherman, Fred Jett, he put, allowed us to put our hydrophone on his pound net at the mouth of the Potomac River. Uh, we had it in the water from May 2016, and it was actually in the water until about September. But as technology goes, there's often issues, and unfortunately, we're not quite shy. Sure, maybe it got knocked, but at the end of June, it stopped recording. So in 2016, we just have this period of detections, but in 2017, we were able to get the whole summer and then right through to early November. And just a couple of things to notice from this graph. So we've got uh, date on the x-axis here, and here on the y-axis we have detection positive hours. So again, this is just giving us an, an indication of how much the dolphins uh, were around. And in both years, you can see, uh, this is in early June, the detections really pick up. And anywhere that the lines are above zero, um, this means we have dolphin detections every day. So you can see in 2017, we have dolphin detections every day, right from June through to mid-September. And even then, it's just a little blip, and then they come back for a bit. Um, so even right through late September and October, we had fairly frequent detections. So these animals are very frequent visitors um, of this area. Now, we wanted to see if there was any relationship uh, with time of the day, because um, 
in some cases, I think, well, maybe the dolphins coming in is related to the food. So are they just following the fish and in they come? And interestingly, we do see a time of day pattern. So here we've got the hour of the day. So one would be 1 a.m. in the morning. And then you've got through the day, here's noon at 12. And then here we come, this is um, 24 would be, would be midnight. And in both the Patuxent River and the Potomac, we see that we have increased occurrence in the late evening through to the early morning. And then we have much lower occurrence in the day. Now in the Patuxent, it is very low, but you can see the, the y-axis are actually different. We just have much higher occurrence in the Potomac than in the Patuxent. So in both cases, we're seeing lower during the day, but they're certainly not absent during the day. They're just not as frequent. And this could be maybe they're feeding more, so they're doing more echolocation activity that we're able to detect. But it could also be, is there something that the fish are doing that either make them more abundant or easier for the dolphins to catch during the night? Um, so this, again, is where the acoustics comes in really handy because we can put them out, leave them to record 24-7. I don't know if anyone will volunteer for the midnight watch, but it can be very challenging to get visual surveys during the night. Uh, so this is a great tool to try and understand some of these patterns. Uh, we then looked at it in terms of tidal state, and here I'm just showing you for the Potomac River. So here, zero represents high tide. Uh, so then these are hours after high tide, so this is an ebb tide um, down to low water. And then here we've got um, the flood tide as it's coming in from low water to high water. And again, we see an interesting pattern where we seem to have higher occurrence during the middle of the flood tide and to some extent also in the ebb tide. So it seems like maybe when the tidal currents are stronger, that's when we get a higher occurrence of dolphins. And again, that might be related to how they're trying to catch fish and how abundant those fish are as they're moving in and out of the rivers. Um, and I just want to mention uh, this picture. So a huge thank you, and I will go into um, the pictures we, we've been sent, but this was just a, a lovely record of um, a group. This was a summer camp by the Southern Maryland Sailing Association, and they happened to be out by Solomon's, and dolphins came around all these little sailing dinghies, and the kids just had a wonderful half an hour where the dolphins were all around the boat. So, yeah, there's been some fantastic stories. Please keep sending us those. Um, so, are they passing by or sticking around? So this is getting to the question of, okay, so dolphins uh, coming into the bay, how long are they spending there? Where are they going? So given that we only had two hydrophones, one at the mouth of the Potomac River and one at the mouth of the Patuxum, we wanted to know, well, were they just hanging out there or are they going further up the rivers? So we looked at how many detection positive minutes we had per hour to give an, an, an idea of how long were they sticking around the hydrophone for. And the hydrophone, with these echolocation clicks and fairly shallow water, we've probably got a detection range of one to two kilometers, so maybe up to a mile. Um, and in the Patuxent, which is shown in red, the majority of our detections are up to five minutes. So fairly short, they're, they're really probably just passing by. And what we want to learn is where are they going up the Patuxent River? Uh, is there a good p feeding place somewhere up there that we need to learn about? And then in the Potomac River, again, we did have very frequent short detections of about five minutes, but then we did have a number of occasions where the um, encounters were up to 25 minutes or even longer. Um, and so it seemed like maybe at the mouth of the Potomac they are sticking Maybe they are feeding there. Um, and, and Janet Mann's team has also shown, she's seen that sometimes it's not that just the same dolphins are sticking around, but that you're just having multiple groups moving through, multiple individuals. And so maybe we're sort of getting this train effect of we're just constantly detecting dolphins as these large numbers come into the river. Um, so trying to learn a little bit more about that. Um, and it became clear that two hydrophones is not enough. <laughs> I get any sense. We need a bigger boat. Um, so <laughs> we decided um, that we needed to increase our coverage. If we really want to know where the dolphins are going, where are the important feeding places, um, we need more coverage. And the trouble is these hydrophones, they're, they're, for a hydrophone, they're not possible. They're about $4,000 each. Um, but we certainly couldn't cover the whole Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay is a big place. If you're including all of the rivers and the tributaries, especially as the dolphins, as I say, seem to be quite happy to go up 
rivers, uh, we just cannot cover the Chesapeake Bay with 100 hydrophones, uh, unless anyone wants to give us that money. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we decided what's another way that we can cover a big area, and so we partnered with, um, a, we collaborated with an NGO called South Wings, which has volunteer pilots. Um, who have gone through uh, various um, requirements so that they uh, are safe for us to fly and they just they are volunteering their plane and their time which has been so helpful to us um, it's just been a fantastic resource and a huge thanks here we have uh, one of the pilots from Baker who we just went out with uh, this week actually so we were doing survey routes um, up the Patuxent River, over the bay, uh, down Tangier Sound, back up the Potomac. Now we do have a naval base here, which means there's a big area of restricted air. So there are certain places we can't go. Um, at the end of 2017 and also in, in this past week, we extended this route to the Rappahannock as well because we'd had a couple of sightings reported in the lower bay. So we wanted to go a little bit further south. And I mean, we can cover this area in about an hour to an hour and a half. So it's just incredible if we think of how many hydrophones we'd need to cover that, or even just boat time. Um, by plane, we can really cover a large area. However, it is just a short time snap. I mean, if you're only out there for an hour and a half, it means were dolphins out there during that hour and a half, or, those, uh, or as you're covering certain areas, those few minutes that you flew over them. And so it does mean that unless they happen to be there, you come back with zero. And unfortunately, that's what we had in 2017. I say, there's no, there's no bad data, it's all good information. But unfortunately, it didn't really help us with that question of where are the dolphins going and where are they feeding. So we needed another approach. So the third approach that we have used is to call on the public. Uh, because we realized that really to cover an area of this size, especially in a place like this where, where most of the areas, you know, there's a lot of people living and sailing and using the water, that could we use them to help us work out where the dolphins go? And there's a couple of things that made this ideal. Uh, one is that people can readily identify a dolphin um, if I had called on a slightly less well-known marine species, that could have been more challenging. Uh, but those people are fairly comfortable saying, yes, I saw a dolphin. The second thing is we only seem to have, as a regular visitor, the bottlenose dolphin. So again, we're not asking you to decide, was it a common dolphin? Was it a white-sided dolphin? Was it a rizzo's dolphin? You don't need to worry. It's, most likely, it's a bottlenose dolphin. And all of the photos that we've been sent so far have shown they, they were all bottlenose dolphins. So again, that makes it much easier. Um, and so we created last year this website. Um, let's have a show of hands. Who went on the website? ChesapeakeDolphinWatch.org. Brilliant, okay, we've got a show of hands. By the end of today, let's make sure we're all raising our hands. Take a look at the website, uh, please do. So right now, uh, we've upgraded the website, so it has a few new features. So if you did go last year, you should see a few new things. Uh, it will automatically take you to sightings for the past month, but there's a little drop down box in the top right corner. You can see all past, so that will show you all the sightings for last year. So you'll see a map a bit like this. Um, obviously that takes longer to load, that's why we changed the default to, to past month. And when the summer's really getting going, you can put it to past seven days as well, so you can see, oh, where are the most recent sightings? If you want to report a sighting, it's very easy. You can just click on the map or you can click for your current location. It, will automa it can automatically populate from your mobile devices, automatic the current location and your, the date time. If you want to change those, if you saw a dolphin earlier in the day or a previous day, you can change those. If you're on your boat and you know the, the GPS lat long, then you can modify that as well. Uh, we now have a description box, so if you want to put in a little information about what you saw that will help us verify, yes, that was definitely a dolphin and, oh, you didn't just see a little wave splash. Uh, that's very helpful. And then we now have the feature of you can upload photos and video directly. 
Um, so, and that, of course, is a huge help. One, to allow us to verify that they were bottlenose dolphins, and two, to see a little bit of behavior. We saw some wonderful videos, as I'll come and show you, of people showing us what, what they were seeing, just getting an idea of the group size and what they were doing, because sometimes it can be hard to describe that. Um, I think, you know, oh, we were just surrounded by dolphins, and it was like, well, what does that mean, how many dolphins? And we do have a little slider so that you can put in the rough group size, but any further information that you want to add, please feel free to put it in. And um, we also have an updates page where I'll put updates through the season, letting you know what, what are people seeing, what are we finding. Um, you can at any time edit or delete your sightings. And then or there's also an information page so that you can go to our website address as well on the university page, which shows a, a lot more information. So please, Add your name to the users. Okay, so we had over 1,500 users last year and over 900 reported sightings. I will say it was a little overwhelming. Based on the number of live sightings that had been reported to the stranding number, we, if we had had 25 to 50 sightings, I would have been really happy. That would have been great. Um, so to have over 900 uh, was a little overwhelming. And of course, we wanted to make sure in, in some of the cases, people just press the button by mistake or they were just giving it a little try. So um, we had set up that we would just email every person who reported a sighting to verify to make sure we're getting science quality data. Um, but that is time consuming. So now if you upload your photos, we can do that. We don't have to contact you. You will only get an, an email if you don't upload um, the photo or something that we can use to verify. Um, so right now we have 433 sightings that were confirmed from last year, which I will show you in a moment. So I say that the short conclusion is there were lots of dolphins. And I get the question of, well, you know, so many people are seeing dolphins, you know, is this just because we've raised awareness and people have somewhere to report it? Or is it that there's more dolphins? And, and that's hard to answer from, from sightings alone because there just wasn't much previous information. We are essentially setting the baseline so that we can now compare this in future years. But based on our high data, um, if you think about that Potomac graph, it was a little higher for 2017. So there are some indications that yes, probably a, there were a few more, there were more dolphins coming in last year. But bottlenose dolphins unfortunately suffered a disease epidemic in 2013 and there were many, many dolphins that were um, up stranded on the beaches and I'm sure many, many more that would have died at sea. So the population is considered depleted and right now is recovering. So we do have a growing population of bottlenose dolphins. And so one of the questions is, do, did we see more dolphins in the bay because you know, maybe it wasn't as good out on the coast and they were moving in, or were there just more dolphins? And our, our hydrophone data off Ocean City indicate we had higher detections in 2017 there as well. So maybe this is a sign of the growing population, they're expanding their range, maybe, maybe the Chesapeake Bay is going to be a more frequent home for them during the summer. And as I mentioned, so this one is in the Patuxent River. Uh, this is the bridge from uh, across Calvert County to St. Mary's County. Um, I'm trying to remember where all these are now. I think this was near Annapolis. This is Helens Creek in um, the Patuxent River. This is off Point Lookout. Um, We've had pictures from all over the place. It was just absolutely fantastic. Thank you for, to everyone who's contributed. And I thought I would show a few little videos. We'll see uh, if this is working. If not, I'll maybe play. Okay, I'm just going to quickly switch to the to the video file so you can see that a little bit better. So. So uh, this is Ken Vincent, who, who was one of our regular reporters. He paddle boards in the south part of the bay, in the lower bay, and he was regularly seeing dolphins. And this was one of his videos where you can see they had just off his paddle board, uh, which I don't know if he, that made him nervous. I think it might make me a little nervous. These are big animals. <laughs> but um, lots of, of great footage from him. And then we also had one I wanted to show from a sailor near Annapolis. So let's click ahead here. So this is from Dana Scanlon. And this is uh, when they were sailing off Annapolis and we've got dolphins to the side. And then you'll see as it pans round at the front as well. 
Hope it's not making you feel seasick. <laughs> And, and this is some of the typical behavior you might see. So you're seeing the surfacing, you're seeing the dorsal fins. It, it can be difficult to count them because, of course, you don't always know, oh, are those the same dolphins that came up or these are different ones unless they're really separated. It, it can be tricky to estimate group size, which is why we, we put the categories on the site. And then this last one was uh, one that was sent by Trevor Strand, and this is from a drone. So here we get a really nice... Um, ability to see not just what the dolphins were doing at the surface but a little bit below the surface as well and so here we have some dolphins going off here and then you also had a couple of dolphins here that are interacting there's another dolphin going off here we see this splash so they're very social um, some of the tail slapping activity we think is also a sound cue as well um, that they, they may be splashing it could be aggressive it could just be some sort of bonding or it sometimes the tail slapping will also give a cue to the group so get some really interesting information um, from, from this um, overhead footage as well and here, I'm going to show you now the confirmed sightings. So if you go on the website, we have just everything that's been reported. These are ones that have all been verified. So we call this science quality. So it's going by week. It was from um, when we launched, 28th of June. We're going through July to August. And you can see they're all over the place. So in terms of where should I put my hydrophones, it, it's made it very difficult because they go right from the south of the bay up to past the Bay Bridge. They were on the east side of the bay, the west side of the bay. They go up the rivers. Uh, what we did see is from late August, kind of September time, definitely a movement, not so much happening in the upper bay, more in the middle and lower bay. And then you can see here, as we get into winter, just in the lower bay. And dolphins can be sighted in the lower bay year round, actually. I mean, they're less frequent um, during, during the winter months, but we have had sightings through the winter months. And I say just, um, in the last couple of months, we've had more sightings down here, so we're just waiting for them to make their way up through, through the middle bay um, and up. So that's why having the website this year, as we only started in late June last year, this year we really want to capture with the start of the season and learning how they move up the bay. Uh, so um, we have, uh, as I say, the, the website, and this is going to be a mobile app. So right now, we're just getting the mobile app version approved um, by, uh, for Android and Apple. And so that will be released, we think, probably mid-May. So if you sign up now for, uh, on the website, then we can notify you when the mobile app version comes out. And our hope there is it just makes it easier for you to keep that in mind and return to it if you want to see, uh, you know, oh, have there been more dolphin sightings? Where were they? Um, and I just want to emphasize that this isn't just... Um, an exercise, oh that's fun, this really is being used in the science. Um, this is providing really critical information to understanding the dolphin's distribution. And I have been contacted by groups that are where they're having permit applications, for example, for bridge activities, pile driving that can produce loud sound. So, oh, well, you know, what, what are the dolphins doing at that time of year and in that location so that they can take that into account, try and make sure that we're, we're not harming these dolphins in any way, even if unintentionally. Um, so you can learn more about our research and the findings from last year if you go to umpsies.edu, so that's the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science website and Dolphin Watch. The, uh, the sightings page is where we have all the information from the public sightings. And then on the research page, we also have our acoustic results um, so that you can uh, take a look at those. And then it's also, of course, got the link to the reporting site. Um, now, we've been trying to raise, rain, uh, raise $500 uh, so that we can put out our hydrophones, our dolphin listening devices again. Uh, we're pretty, pretty close to that goal, so I'm really excited. We're going to be putting the hydrophones out again this year. Um, if you are able to contribute, that's fantastic. You can do that through the Chesapeake Dolphin Watch site, or there's also a link on the UMPSI's Dolphin Watch page. So thank you. If there's anyone here who has donated, thank you very much.
And a big thank you to, I mean, I'm certainly not doing this work by myself. Um, there is a, a team of people, of students and research assistants that have been helping along, along the way and a huge thank you to them. And the, the Chesapeake Dolphin Watch uh, website and app has been funded by the Chesapeake Bay Trust, uh, the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory and with support um, from the software developer Track Software, they, they develop uh, software for a lot of aquariums and zoos, including the Baltimore Aquarium, which is who we were collaborating with when we developed the website. So thank you very much for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. going up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, so just an observation, I'm sure most people in this room also are voters like me. Mm. Um, I've been sailing on the bay since 2005, and the King's here I go pretty much every weekend starting end of April through the end of October. Oh, great. Um, primarily south of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, probably down to Solomon's Island. It's typically mm -hmm. the that I've gone all the way down from the way out to Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Okay. You feel like since 2013? Okay. That's yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly that would match up. I'd say 2013 was when they had hundreds of bottlenose dolphins um, that died from this disease epidemic. So, so if there's more around, I'd say maybe that's relating to this, this recovery of the population. Or, or to the health of the bay. <laughs> Do you see them with, have you seen them feeding? Have you uh, been? Not really feeding, I just see them typically traveling. They go from mm -hmm. point A to point B, and they will be yeah. And the other thing that I see more of is turtles. Um, oh, the sea turtles? Sea turtles. Okay. Yeah. And that's typically from Poplar Island south through the Hunger River. Okay. Yeah, so the, I, I do study sea turtles um, as well, and we have talked about making the website for sea turtles too. The concern there was the identification part, sort of can you tell a leatherback turtle from a loggerhead turtle from <laughs> a hawktail turtle? There it gets a little trickier, but it's really interesting, and there has been um, some satellite tracking of sea turtles in the bay, and I was amazed, yeah, how much, how often they visit and how frequently they're in the bay, it's, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, this is not scientific, but my experience <laughs> is that we see the turtles after a hurricane. Okay. So I used to get on my boat to pass like that on a hurricane, we have to go to see if I can go find turtles in that. Uh, well, so and, get, some of them are pretty big. Yeah, oh yeah, they can get very big. Um, Yes, um, so we do have at the Chesapeake Biological Lab uh, a team that is studying jellyfish and they found that they get very high densities of jellyfish in, in some of the rivers in sort of August time and interestingly as we get into late August so the fish move away avoiding the jellyfish and that seems to match up somewhat with what we're seeing with the dolphins of them. So perhaps they're following the fish who are avoiding the jellyfish, whereas obviously for a sea turtle, jellyfish is food. <laughs> so yeah, good time for them. Yeah. Lee, did you have a question? Um, the net, I, I agree with you completely. I've been out on the bay yeah. fishing since um, 1997. And I almost never saw a dolphin before, but especially the last two years. Yeah. Plentiful. Okay. But, I, the next time I see him, I'll take a picture, and I'm going to take a picture of my fish finder. Yeah. Because oh, I don't know whether the dolphins are attracted to tight bunches of Manhattan. Oh, or probably. They're, they're making the yeah. Manhattan into a tight bunch. But yeah. it certainly seems, if we see dolphins, I look at the fish finder, and it's usually a solid blob yeah. of regenerating <laughs> Manhattan, because you can't see any individual fish. Okay. And it just seems to be a solid block. And that's, I don't think that's the dolphins. It, it can mm. pick up individual fish, mm. except if they're really small and tightly packed. Okay. Yeah, no, that would be that would be really helpful if you can. I think I mean obviously the dolphins they do live in groups and they can they could cooperate while they're feeding to potentially corral fish. Um, but but if there is a dense aggregation then they, they could well be attracted that's to that. What I'm guessing is it's densely mm -hmm. aggregated first and then the dolphins sense that. Right. And they're definitely not shy. Yeah. We have to stop fishing a lot because they are they yeah. care less that the that the motors run. 
Yeah. Oh, I mean, yes. It, it's really interesting. I'm in terms of thinking about. Um, say, we heard the boat noise. Now, the boat noise is generally lower frequency than their most of their calls. It sort of gets into the lower part of their whistles, but certainly the echolocation calls a higher frequency because there's been a couple of papers showing that that dolphins. Um, do less foraging activity when there's a lot of boat noise. And it's like, well, it's sort of interesting because their, sh their echolocation should not really be affected by that if it's, you know, just the, the frequencies are different and not overlapping. But is there some fish response, perhaps? Um, and we're not quite sure. And as you said, I mean, dolphins bow ride, they'll be ab around boats. I've had a lot of people who said, you know, I tried to stay away from the dolphins, but they came towards us. So, yeah, they, they're not shy. And particularly, you know, potentially if the fish are sheltering under a boat, then woof, they're a target. So, um, yes, the dolphins. And, and that's in some way, again, why they're, they're a great species to study because they're so co coastal and they're not shy at all. Harbour porpoises would be a very different story. We get um, a lot of porpoise detections off Ocean City in the winter and um, there weren't many sightings at all but of course it's like well how many boats are out in the winter? The harbour porpoises are much smaller, they don't bow ride, they don't leap, they have a very small triangular fin and often in winter it's rougher weather so the ability to see them it, it's really hard whereas with the dolphins they tend to be a lot more showy. They could, mostly just sort of at the mouth, we think. They're seen in, in the lower part of the bay at the mouth and, and generally in the winter because in the summer they're, they're moving further north. Yeah. There was one day last summer, probably in June or early July, there were pelicans. Mm. that time of year. Yeah. And that day probably saw groups of 20 at a time. Like uh -huh. that. Yeah. There were some fish yeah. going on. Going on that brought both pelicans in. There. Yeah. And I have to say, certainly when we're doing offshore surveys, we often use birds as cues because you see the bird activity. And it's like, oh, something's going on. Are there dolphins or whales around? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and the birds, you know, obviously, well, usually I think it's probably the dolphins are around the fish and then the, the birds see that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's exciting to see the pelicans too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I've only seen them once off Solomon's. I think they do sometimes, but yeah, yeah. Already regulations in place to protect them, um, in, but I think what what we wanted to make sure is that dolphins were taken into account when they're considering any environmental impact of a human activity. Because um, I mean, obviously, the bay is very well known for the fisheries and the oysters and the restoration, but, but dolphins weren't really being, it's like, oh yeah, sometimes they're dolphins, but they're dolphins, but they weren't considered a regular enough visit that they were really being considered as a component of the ecosystem. And we just wanted to make sure that was considered. Now, if, if 2017 turned out to be anomaly, that, oh, we just happen to have one year of lots of dolphin sightings and other years there's very few, then it's like, okay, well, you know, there, there may be less of an effect. But, but certainly what we're hearing is, is we're hearing in here as well. Is it, I mean, it probably isn't the case. They probably just are more frequent visitors and we weren't documenting it. So we just want to make sure that's taken into account. So if, so for example, I mean, different activities have different potential effects. So, so anything that's producing very loud sounds then obviously dolphins that are very sensitive to sound, we just they would want to make sure, sort of estimate, you know, what would their exposure level be? Um, could there be any potential harmful impacts um, with the fishing activities? So, for example, pound nets in Virginia are already regulated, and they have certain requirements to prevent entanglement. And as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any recent entanglement. So. Um, that, that doesn't seem to have been an issue recently. Um, so, so things seem to be going fairly well. We just want to be able to make sure that if things aren't, we would 
be able to know that. Um, because without having baseline data, it's like, well, are there more this year? Are there fewer this year? We, we just couldn't say. It just hadn't been systematically documented. So we just want to make sure we're, we're keeping an eye on things. Yeah. So the one that I was studying would be called a demonstrator project. It was two wind turbines that were actually to power an oil rig that had been there for some years. So um, a demonstrator project similarly has been proposed off Virginia. So it's not a f it wasn't a full-scale wind farm, but it was two wind turbines at the time back in... Um, 2005, 2006, um, it was the deepest water that a wind turbine had been installed. It was 45 meters deep, um, and it was the largest wind turbine. It was five megawatts. These days, five and six megawatts, even up to eight megawatts, um, are not uncommon. So they can be much larger. It does mean, obviously, the idea is for the same amount of energy, you can have fewer turbines is the idea. Um, now, what we found in Scotland is although there had been a marine protected area assigned for the dolphin to protect the dolphins, and the, the wind turbine and the oil rig were outside of that, but there was still concern that it could affect the population. But we actually found there was very little use of that area by the bottlenose dolphins. They were very coastal. Um, so at most of the time, they were about 40 kilometers away. Um, but the species that did occur there frequently was the harbour porpoise. And so that's, in Europe, that's actually been the species for which we have the most information about their response to offshore wind farms. Um, so for the bottlenose dolphins, we didn't detect any effect, but they were quite far away. Um, for the harbour porpoises, we didn't detect any effect after the installation, the, the pile driving. The pile driving is the loudest part of the installation. It's when they essentially hammer this pile, this nail, <laughs> into the seabed so that they can secure the foundation of the turbine. And during the pile driving, there didn't appear, we couldn't detect any effect um, during the first turbine, but during the pile driving of the second turbine, there was a short-term avoidance. Um, so they moved out of the area for a short while, but then they did come back again. So whether they did, either they, they didn't like the sounds that they heard from the first one, and so for the second one they were like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick a little further away. Um, but yeah, so it seems like we've only had short-term disturbance. In most cases, they've come back, and what they're now finding now that offshore wind farms have been in the water for longer in Europe is they're actually serving as an aggregator quite often as well, and an attractant. For example, they'd satellite tracked seals, and the seals were basically dining <laughs> at the turbines because the turbines are usually installed on a sandy seabed and then all of a sudden you put this hard structure in the water so things settle on it, you get all the shellfish on it, then you get the fish and then quite often you know, either fishing is, is not allowed within the immediate vicinity for safety and insurance reasons, or it's just, you know, they don't want to risk their gear around it. So if there's less fishing in the immediate facility, you've suddenly got this haven for fish, and the, the dolphins and the seals can, can be attracted to that, potentially. Yeah. You mentioned that the dolphins, when they see each other, recognize each mm. other Yeah, so um, it's really interesting because they found that the contour, so uh, let me see if I can go back, um, just so I can make sure it's, I'm going to use these terms, it's clear. Oops, come back. Um, so here, so these whistles, if you look, for example, here, we have two. So the contour is, is the shape, how the frequency is changing over time. These look like two chairs. And um, so when we get repetition of a particular sound in a, in a particular way, um, we can recognize that as a signature whistle, that dolphins are calling out their name. And, and they found in the field that this tends to happen when, when different individuals or different groups are meeting at sea. They, they start calling out their name. 
And unlike us, so when we got, for example, if I call my mum, I can say, hi, mum, and she immediately knows it's me. I don't have to say, hi, it's Helen. Um, you can just tell, for, she can tell from my voice, it's me. But what they found is dolphins can't do that, probably because of how the sound is underwater. They, they can't tell, they can't recognize the voice. And so the, the contour shape seems to provide all of that information. And so again, the, the fear is if you have, something that's masking it, if you have another sound that's overlapping with that, then it would be hard for them to tell, so what are you saying, what do you say? Um, so yeah, so they can actually recognize each other and um, it's, it's interesting because say, dolphins actually have very large brains for their size. I mean, people have probably heard they're very intelligent, but even if you think of whales, um, they're really big animals. Their brains proportionally are, are smaller, and we think it's related to, to the fact that these are such social animals, and they're doing these interactions so frequently. And what I would love to know is what are they saying? Um, I might, I'm, I'm afraid, I don't know if these are expletives, but <laughs> um, it would be one Wonderful to know because I am sure they are communicating information. And one of the things we're looking at is when they feed, do we see any other other sounds that are associated that might be like, hey, I I just corralled this fish, get over there, or hey, I just found a fish, come over and help me. Um, also, uh, the other thing I want to look at is we have had fish tag receivers on our moor some of our moorings. And so if we have shark detections, which can be predators of dolphins, do we hear particular sounds? So we're trying to see if there are ways that we can try and learn a little bit more about what these sounds might mean, because at the moment it's still quite a mystery. Primarily based on ships' logs, captains and merchant ships and fishermen's logs. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you guys gone back and looked at that to see what kind of dolphin activity they report. Because back then, the they say that yeah. the, the bay was clear to clear the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so certainly the bay has gone through some changes, and it, is, it can be hard with some of these anec anecdotal uh, pieces of evidence and reports to, to work out exactly what was going on. Um, people also seem to interchangeably sometimes use dolphin and porpoise, so it's like which one were they referring to? Um, but certainly there, there's a, um, uh, a student who, um, within uh, Janet Mann's team, who is hoping to interview people who've lived around the bay. So certainly sort of within their lifetimes, what were the things that they were seeing? Um, and I don't know if she's going further back as well. It can, it can just be challenging and quite time consuming. I think certainly the perspective that I've taken is let's try and establish a baseline now and then see how it moves forward. But I say there, there are other people who are researching the bay who are looking at the historical record as well. Um, help us compare. The Royal Navy was in the bay back then, uh, <laughs> and so they took depth soundings yeah. they felt shot so they could chase right. you know, the rebels. Um, <laughs> but, but there was clear water to 30 feet. Wow. And it was, it was the, the shots are all hard bottom bay today, it's soft bottom bay, mm. that's because those are all oyster. Yeah, yeah. You could run a ship aground on an oyster bay. And I would say the last since so five, I remember maybe you could see down from one to six inches to surface water in the day, sometimes that's a foot or more. Mm. Just in the last, I don't know if you've had the same experience noticing the water get clearer. So you feel like the oyster restoration may be helping? Yeah, I think, mm. I don't know what the explanation <laughs> is. My understanding is they've taken a lot of steps to try and prevent mm -hmm. uh, fertilizer runoff from plants. Right. Mm. Primarily putting away from the areas along the coast. Yeah. And that's caused the algae blooms or shrink, is what they're saying. But, I know. But, I mean, you can see the water clearer in the water. Oh, that's good. I mean, seeing the results is, is fantastic. And it's like, there's been numerous efforts to try and help restore the oyster reefs, to try and um, improve the health of the bay, make it cleaner, have healthy fish stocks. So I, I think all of those efforts, you want to have a healthy ecosystem. And say, I mean, the dolphins are a natural part of the ecosystem. And then one of the sort of 
you know, perhaps for, for, for the public, easier parts to see. Um, and you're not necessarily being able to see well, how many Menhaden were there, how many striped bass were there. Some of these things can be harder to see. Um, but the dolphins, I mean, they, they want to feed on the fish. And, and what was interesting, I mean, they can... In Scotland, we sometimes saw lesions on their skin, and we weren't sure if it was related to the cold partly to the cold water and, and lower blood flow to the skin, but also at that time, um, there were small little communities and there was no sewage treatment. So the sewage was going straight out and there was concern, you know, maybe they were getting some skin infections and so on. So, so there are various things that we can look at. The, the dolphins are sort of an indicator. And so certainly seeing abundant healthy dolphins, we hope is a good sign. And, and this, as you say, other way, the clarity of the water and other things to try and see, have we got a nice healthy bay ecosystem? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.